Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now before I get started, let me just quickly tell you I have uploaded another video on the second car channel. I bought the cheapest Fiat 500 I could find and I've reviewed it over there. I'd also like to let you know that I've uploaded uh, on the third channel, Classic Gaming in HD, we took a look at the very last PlayStation 2 game ever released and uh, I've uploaded that over there as well. Links to both of those videos in the description. Of course, check them out if you want to. I thought I'd let you know here on this channel just in case you wanted to take a look at some of my other projects. But we must move on because today we're taking a look at this. This is an HP XW6600 workstation, and back in late 2008, this configuration would have cost you over 5,000 US dollars. Today, I paid just 25 pounds for it. Maybe it was because the seller wanted it gone, or maybe it was because someone had knackered the door, but I can't help but feel I got a good deal. So why was it so costly all those years ago, and is it still a fast and powerful beast by modern standards? Well, let's talk specs. This model features two of the fastest CPUs compatible with this system, a pair of Xeon E5450s clocked at 3GHz. Launching in late 2007, these retailed for close to $1,000 each, and I myself along with other YouTubers have spoken of our fondness for old Xeons before, as they can still hold their own in both processor-bound applications and games. With 4 cores, 4 threads and 12 megabytes of L2 cache, they can also be modded to run on the Socket 775 platform and will offer similar to top tier Core 2 quad performance, though running them in a dual socket 771 board means you can pair them up for a snappy octa-core experience that will rival even modern quad-core CPUs. This old beast also features 2 gigs of ECC DDR2 memory clocked at 667 MHz, a small amount by today's standards, but more than enough to run every 3D design and editing program a decade ago. The memory modules are cooled by this trio of fans which also helps to keep the interior of this rig very cool, a must for a workstation that was designed to run 24-7. But what about the graphics card? What behemoth lays within this tall, heavy enclosure? Well that would be the Quadro FX 4600, a 768 megabyte GPU that launched in 2007. The 4600 is pretty much an 8800 GTX, with firmware better optimised for workstation applications. As such, it also carried a hefty premium of $2000, more than three times the cost of its consumer GTX counterpart. All this is powered by an 80 plus rated 650 watt power supply that still functions almost silently after all this time. So let's switch it on. The first issue I had was that Windows only saw one processor, but I quickly noticed that the previous owner had been running Windows 7 Home, which won't recognise a dual CPU setup. Think of all that wasted power. So I bought a super cheap eBay key, burnt a Windows 7 Pro disc, and confirmed that the system was now running as it should. Now I know the GPU is going to be limited by its GDDR3 memory and DX10 support, but the dual CPUs are what had me interested. After all, we had 8 cores and threads to play with, so I fired up Cinebench R15. Running the multi-core test and I wasn't sure what to expect, but even at stock speeds, the dual quad cores, if that makes sense, scored a total that was hot on the tail of the i7-3770. Running Geekbench 4 and it was clear to see that the single core score reflected this processor's age, but the multi-core result was quite respectable, confirming that CPU heavy applications is where a PC like this will still demonstrate its true calling. Take video editing in Premiere Pro for example, a program that will use as many cores as you have to offer. Even with just 2 gigs of memory, it blazed through rendering tasks like they were nothing. Power like this must have seemed almost unbelievable 10 years ago. That processing power also came in handy for gaming, though the graphics card was never truly designed for it, and sat maxed out most of the time. First of all, I tried a lightweight title in the form of Minecraft, which sat at near 60fps on the fancy settings at 1080p almost constantly. I then put a few more demanding DX10 supported AAA titles to the test, including Crisis of course, and found that each one was playable on this card. Although Crisis came out around the same time as this system, and Tomb Raider isn't all that demanding, the title that surprised me the most was Battlefield 3, which ran very well with a reduced resolution. Okay, so while this thing obviously isn't worth 5 grand today, 
there is plenty of room to upgrade. Before I do so at a later date, let me tell you what could be done to a system like this to make it suitable for modern games and whether or not it's worth it. Firstly, the dual Xeons are fine and will still be able to handle most games out there. As I said before, I think these are the best CPUs you can get that work on this board anyway. The power supply should also suffice and although it offers enough wattage for beefier cards, the single 6 pin connector means you'd have to upgrade it or use a Molex adapter for some higher end GPUs. It may be tempting to just stick a 1050 in this thing and be done with it, but for this project I'm going to go for something that doesn't seem to be a little bit overdone by now. There are also two PCI Express slots on the board, so SLI may be worth considering, but because the second slot is rated at just 75 watts, you'd be better off just using one more powerful card. This bad boy also supports up to 32 gigs of RAM. I don't have any compatible ECC memory on me, but luckily these days it can be found at a reasonable price and will really help when it comes to running multiple programs. So, 10 years later and over $4,000 less, I think I've got a pretty good deal on this old workstation, even if it will need a few upgrades to get it ready for this year of gaming. So, there we have it. I hope you've enjoyed this look at this once $5,000 plus PC, what it can do in 2018, and what sort of upgrade you could make to a machine like this if you're thinking of buying one yourselves. As always, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it, leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and I look forward to seeing all of you in the next one.